Thank you for joining us today at our Don't Panic for GDPR Challenges and Solutions webinar. So today I would like to introduce our moderator, Mac. Um, he is the Director of Sales Engineering in the EMEA region for ZL Technologies to start off our webinar. Thanks, Mac. Thank you, Beverly. So <clears throat> I'd like to introduce the uh, two people who were doing the majority of the presentation here. Michael Osterman, uh, he is the principal of Osterman Research, an independent analyst firm focusing on the messaging and collaboration space. Uh, prior to founding Osterman Research, Michael was the Vice President of Market Research at Creative Networks. Uh, his background includes research and analysis of various markets, including computer-aided software engineering, data communications, telecommunications, and the fiber optic component. Uh, so we're glad to have Michael here. He's, I think, an outstanding analyst in this field. We also have Reed um, from Viewpoint LLC. He's the Executive Vice President of Viewpoint. <clears throat> Reed is responsible for the overall, uh, sorry, excuse me, overall um, strategy and integrated marketing effort at Viewpoint. He's been in this uh, industry for 25 plus years. Um, he has experience with records management and information governance, uh, member of the EDRM and GDPR working group, and currently heads up the IGRM uh, working group, and has been a member of excuse me, has been a member uh, of that for 25 years plus. Viewpoint has provided a private clouds, um, delivers, sorry, delivers private clouds, ECM, and InfoGov for the last 19 years. So I will move on now to Michael, who will take over the um, speaking. Michael. Sorry. Well, Mac, Oops. thank you very Yeah, no, sorry, I, just, I should have just gone through the agenda. So Michael is going to do the first two pieces of this. Um, and from now on, Michael. Very good. Well, Mac, thank you very much. And I'd like to thank everybody who's here on the call with us today. Essentially, what we're going to do is, is really start out, um, you know, discussing what the GDPR is and, and why it's important to organizations, uh, regardless of where you are in the world. This is not just a European directive. Uh, this is essentially a worldwide directive in terms of its impact on organizations. We're going to talk about the extent of GDPR awareness today. Uh, I'll give you a hint, it's not ex as extensive as it needs to be. Uh, we'll talk about the face, uh, you know, facing the influx of subject access requests. Uh, Reed will talk a lot about that. And then we will take your questions. And we would like to answer as many questions as we can. So please uh, send them through the, the GoToWebinar interface. So essentially what we're talking about with regard to the um, GDPR is, and if we can get the next slide, please, perfect. Um, it's, it's really an extension of the data protection directives that have been in place in the European Union for many years. Uh, going back to 1995 with the EU Directive on Data Protection, what the GDPR is essentially doing is harmonizing all of the different member states' uh, interpretations of that data protection directive and basically bringing them under a harmonized structure as well as adding some penalties as we'll get into here in just a bit. So fundamentally, uh, nothing has changed in terms of the, the data protection itself, but it really has expanded. Uh, there are new rights for, uh, for subjects, uh, data subjects, uh, new rights of access, and so forth. And so fundamentally, the GDPR applies to really any organization that has or controls data on a resident of the European Union, uh, even if that organization has no operations in Europe, uh, no operations in the EU, if they possess the data at all, uh, they are subject to it. So that furniture manufacturer in North Carolina or that you know, auto parts uh, distributor in Southern California, if they have data on EU data subjects, they will be subject to the GDPR. Next slide, please. So is it important? Well, yes, absolutely it's important. Uh, because the GDPR is going to apply to any organization anywhere in the world that possesses data on an EU resident, it's going to be very important to really understand the GDPR, understand the implications of it, understand your obligations as a, as a data possessor, if you will, as a data controller. Uh, and the cost of complying with the GDPR is, is really going to be fairly significant uh, if you don't have the systems and the processes in place today to manage data appropriately. So you're going to have to focus, uh, and we'll get into this in, in just a bit, but you're, you'll have to focus on things like archiving and security and, and data management and information governance and so forth. 
And so if you don't have those systems and those technologies in place, the cost of compliance is going to be fairly significant. But the cost of, of non-compliance is going to be significantly greater. Uh, the GDPR carries with it some major penalties. For example, up to 4% of your organization's annual revenue or 20 million euros, whichever is greater. Uh, and taking the text from the, the GDPR, the penalties will be effective, proportionate, and dissuasive. Bottom line here is that if you violate the GDPR, it is going to be a painful exercise. Uh, there are going to be some you know, very significant ramifications. And you know, one of the questions that a lot of people ask is, you know, does the, does the European Union have the ability to enforce GDPR worldwide? I think you know, the, the quick answer is yes. Uh, you know, certainly there are going to, be, going to be some nuances to that. Uh, you know, there is going to be different interpretations of this and so forth, but, but fundamentally, you have to be prepared to face penalties from the GDPR if you violate it. So in terms of the rights that are protected under the GDPR, uh, there are several rights. For example, uh, there's the right of access by data subjects. And again, Reed is going to get into that in, in just a bit here. But uh, if, if somebody uh, has data on, them, uh, you know, on somebody in the European Union, the individuals on whom you have data have a right to find out what you have. They have a right to, to access that data. They also have a right to be forgotten in many cases. So if you possess data on someone in the EU, uh, that individual has a right to, to ask that you expunge all of that data. Now, there are some cases where that, that won't apply, for example, criminal records and things of that nature. But generally, you have an obligation to essentially delete everything from your archives uh, about those individuals who ask to be forgotten. There's the right to rectification. Uh, if there's an error in the data that you possess on an EU resident, they have the right to ask that you correct that data, correct those, those errors in, um, in, in your records. There's a right to restriction of processing. Uh, there's a, an EU data subject has a right uh, to ask you not to do certain things with their records. There's a right to object. Uh, there's the right of security of processing. And finally, there's a, a right around transfer of personal data to others. So fundamentally, these rights for EU data subjects translate to a number of obligations that information holders uh, have, to, have to carry out. And these are not easy things to do because most organizations today don't have a good handle on their records. And we'll get into that in just a bit. Uh, they don't know where all of their information is and particularly in an era of bring your own device bring your own cloud bring your own mobile app there's a lot of corporate data that's sitting outside the jurisdiction of the corporation itself uh, individual employees manage a lot of corporate data one of the fundamental things that organizations complying with the gdpr are going to have to do is essentially to bring all that data under one umbrella. There's going to have to be a unified view of all of the information that an organization possesses. And that's something that today, a lot of organizations uh, simply don't have available to them. Next slide, please. So in terms of the requirements on information holders under the GDPR, uh, you're going to have to protect personal data. You have to protect it from breaches. Uh, today, if you're in the United States, for example, uh, 47 of the 50 states have data breach notification requirements. Uh, you can consider the GDPR essentially those requirements on steroids. Uh, you're going to have to very seriously protect data and prevent it from being breached. You're going to have to maintain very good controls over your processing operations, and you're going to have to document all of those so that you can run audits to understand you know, how that data is being managed, where it's being sent, uh, how it's being protected. You'll have to perform a risk assessment. You really need to understand what your risks are under the GDPR and ensure that you can mitigate those risks to the greatest extent possible. You have to be able to demonstrate compliance with the GDPR, and this is key because you have to prove that your processes are in place, that you can do the audits, that you have the encryption, that you have the, the unified archive and so forth that can demonstrate your compliance with GDPR. You have to establish very robust uh, re retention capabilities. You have to be able to ensure that you're protecting data um, and that you're, you're, uh, you're retaining it for the length of time required and so that you can also defensively delete that data. You have to keep very good records, and that's something that a lot of organizations today really aren't doing, but you are going to have to maintain excellent records on all of the information you have on EU data, data residents. 
Uh, you have to monitor for data breaches. This is another key aspect of the GDPR because you have a very short timeline for reporting those breaches if they do occur. Organizations have to establish the role of data protection officer. And this is also key because a lot of organizations today just don't have somebody in that role. Uh, what some organizations will do is probably outsource that to a third party to serve that function within the organization. But there is going to have to be that role somewhere within the organization. And then there are just a variety of other things to, to know and do with regard to, to GDPR. So a couple of really important issues here. Um, in Article 4 of the GDPR, it defines personal data as any information relating to an identified or identifiable natural person who can be identified directly or indirectly by reference to an identifier. And the GDPR defines an identifier as something like a name, an identification number, maybe a social security number, for example, uh, any geolocation data, and any other identifying factor, maybe uh, you know physical data, mental data, cultural data, and so forth. And essentially, you have to prevent data from being tied to data subjects. So, for example, uh, you know, if, if you do have a data breach, the data has to be anonymized in such a way that individuals cannot be identified from the breached data. And it's absolutely essential that organizations maintain very strict controls on personal data. And it's something that a lot of organizations aren't doing today. I've seen a number of surveys uh, done by other companies. And what we've found is that a lot of people are not really clued into all of the implications of the GDPR. I saw a survey recently, for example, that said a very large proportion of data managers were not aware that their marketing automation databases were subject to GDPR, despite the fact that there's enormous amounts of data on EU residents within those databases, and it's data that can be identified. They can tie a name to you know, some characteristic of the individual and so forth. And so there's going to be a need to really to be an upheaval in the way that organizations manage data today, because a lot of organizations simply are not managing data in a way that will be compliant with the GDPR. Next slide, please. So this came from a survey we did recently, uh, did this in June of this year. And we asked organizations, and these were mid-sized and large organizations, mostly in North America, if they're really ready for the GDPR, if they're really ready for, for full compliance. What we found is that 55% of organizations have a complete inventory of all their IT and data assets, meaning 45% don't. And this is a serious implication for GDPR compliance because if you don't have a good inventory of your data, if you don't have a unified archive that allows you to access all of that data on demand, that's going to create some, some major potential violations of the GDPR and get organizations into a lot of trouble. We also found that, that only 42% of organizations were very familiar with the key provisions of the GDPR, including the penalties for noncompliance. So a lot of organizations today really just don't understand the GDPR that well. They don't understand the, the penalties, the, the, uh, you know, all of the risks associated with violating it. Only 41% of uh, organizations told us that all of their data assets are managed adequately in the context of the GDPR. So again, uh, three out of five organizations just are not managing their data assets appropriately. 41% uh, said that they have identified their data assets and business processes where EU citizen data is managed. Again, three out of five have not done that. And I won't go through the rest here uh, in the interest of time, but fundamentally what we're finding in our research is that a lot of organizations, and these are you know good-sized organizations, just are not yet ready for the GDPR. And they've got just a little over six months to get ready because it goes into effect on May 25th of next year. Next slide, please. We also wanted to ask about the maturity of current processes. And what we found is that you know, there's some level of maturity with regard to um, GDPR compliance, but a lot of organizations really, and this is self-reporting, they don't consider their, their processes to be all that mature. What we found is that only 9% of organizations that we surveyed, one out of 11, feel that their processes are very mature in the context of GDPR compliance, but the vast majority are not. Uh, there are a lot of organizations that don't have the ability to archive and encrypt and otherwise protect data in compliance with GDPR. And in order to gain full compliance, these bars are going to have to shift very seriously to the right. 
Now, one of the problems uh, in, in GDPR compliance is that a lot of organizations have not yet budgeted for it. And again, this goes back to June, so things are probably slightly different now, but, but probably not very much. We found in that survey that only 44% of organizations today have an IT budget that's devoted to GDPR compliance. Another 13% said that they don't have budget today, but they will have budget later this year. 28% uh, told us that um, they will have budget in 2018, and 18% said, no, we have absolutely no plans for it. So bottom line is that we have a very large proportion of organizations that just don't uh, have budget available for GDPR, and they run the, the really the very serious risk of noncompliance. So at this point, I would like to hand it over to Reed Irvin. Reed, the floor is yours. Great, Michael. I really appreciate it. And uh, kind of taking a step off from, from where you stopped there, it's uh, really the question of how do you get what you need? No budget. People aren't aware. Uh, there's a lot of challenges here. And in looking at the audience we have today, certainly we have a very broad audience from around the world, uh, heavily U.S. focused, uh, but across many industries as well. So it's a really big and, uh, and broad slice of the folks that uh, who GDR could potentially and absolutely would, would apply to. So the big question is that as you look at this, what, what do you need to do? How do you do it? Well, a big part of the recognition in your organization is to do those things that bring you to compliance. Now, as you can tell, Michael and I spend a lot of our time in the field talking to real people who are experiencing this, and he had some great uh, polling results, and I have one here that I'm sharing. Now, this one is very recent, and uh, uh, this uh, was a session, came from a session I did at the uh, Arm Alive conference in Orlando just about a month ago. So this is very fresh information. Uh, to give you a sense of the audience, um, uh, a couple hundred uh, organizations, uh, there was a portion that were uh, highly regulated global organizations, um, U.S.-based focus, but some international uh, organizations as well. So it's not, not a bad slice, but take a look at this because this is really, really interesting. So Michael talked a lot about budget and all those kinds of challenges. Well, look at this, and, and this is very telling. There's some good news here too, but there's some bad news as well. But you know, the good news is 25% or so, and I'm rounding up because it's 23%, are really taking GDPR seriously. And if you note how we worded the questions, I was trying to really get to the specifics of what organizations were thinking about this. So see the first one, yes, my organization is taking it seriously. So not only seriously, but someone is responsible. Because as you learn about GDPR, and Michael covered a lot of this, and Mac is going to cover some more after I speak, but there are people that need to be assigned to this. And a lot of that is part of the legislation uh, itself in terms of responses when people ask for uh, uh, information about their information. So, okay, so 25%. But look at the rest. If you add that up, there's some variation of really doing nothing versus only knowing a little. And the most telling, of course, is that big bar that sticks out to the right of 51%, so over half, had heard nothing. So there wasn't even a conversation going on. So what does that tell us? It tells us that there's an awareness challenge here because if organizations really understood what this meant and how it could potentially impact the organization, they would take it seriously. And by the way, not just organizations who for sure know that they are keeping EU uh, data on citizens, but those that could potentially be because it's important to take this seriously and take a look. So this is a real opportunity for many of you out there to be a leader, quite frankly, and to uh, drive the awareness, and in some cases, maybe even be a hero, depending on uh, the amount of uh, EU citizen data that, that you're having. So, so with that, how do you take a practical view of this and take practical action? And let's kind of roll to, to the next slide. So at this point, I mean, basically, I hope everybody's scared enough. That was the, the title of, of the webinar. So we've showed you all kinds of data about why it's scary and expensive and you're going to get, somebody's going to walk in and you're going to get penalized and everybody's going to be angry. Well, what are we going to do about this? So this is the don't panic part of the program. So given the gaps that we've talked about and Michael and I highlighted, looking through a practical lens, uh, what are those things that you can do based upon your GDPR risk profile. And I say that because if you're based in Europe, well, you're dead center, right? You, you know it applies to you. If you're outside of Europe, but collecting data on EU citizens, you, you're, it's going to apply to you. But if you're in the US and maybe you're not doing business in Europe, but potentially thinking about it, 
you still better think about it. So in some way, shape, or form, your risk profile may change. So how much uh, time, effort, and funds you want to put against it will differ. So you need to throttle it appropriately. But there are things you really do need to be doing. And remember, although it's scary and the fines can be big, this is the intention. This is to empower individuals. And this is an important. This is a trend that's happening around the globe so that uh, people have control of their information. So it's not intended, as I have underlined there, to penalize business. But I tell you what, it has teeth. So let's just talk a little bit about that. So very basically, uh, if you know it uh, applies to you, there are some uh, responsibilities in terms of assigning people for it. You need to assign a, a DPO. This is uh, something that's important. It's part of the legislation, and a data protection officer is part of it. But if you're in the U.S. and uh, it doesn't directly apply to you or not yet, you still should have someone assigned to it because you need someone that uh, understands it and can validate and look at the organization to make sure they're ready if and when it does. So there are things that would fall into this person's purview, defendable retention periods for personal data, um, authorizing specific workflows and things around uh, personal data, and outlining how that retained data will be managed and then eventually uh, purged because there are specific requirements around that. So getting someone assigned is important. Understanding your data is important. Now, look, this is not a new new concept here. This is this is basic information governance, right? And there are some things that really align with the GDPR and good information governance and governance of your data. So really, if, if you're keeping your house in order, you're probably a good ways down the path of being prepared. Maybe you're not there, but at least uh, you've taken a good first few steps. So understanding your data, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about that in, a, in another slide, is important. Uh, a GDPR ready, readiness assessment, I, I kind of call this out specifically because quite frankly, what I just talked about are aspects of that, but there are vendors uh, that can do that. There are consultants that can do that, that at uh, a high level for U.S. companies that need a, a you know, kind of a, a view of a, a holistic view of the organization. This is something you should potentially think about and bring someone to do so you have a view of it because until you have a view of the landscape you really don't know what the big steps are going to be or maybe little steps are, are all you need to really be prepared and, and something else i wanted to, to to point out is there's a big focus on and you'll hear folks like myself and michael and many many a host of others across the industry talk about this but we're usually talking about the organization but your partners and vendors you do business with are a big part of this as well. And this is kind of the tricky part. Now, for those of you that are doing business in the cloud or have uh, contemplated it, you know that when you're analyzing cloud providers, I'm kind of making an analogy here, uh, you not only have to understand the cloud provider, but the vendors that support the cloud provider, right? It's the same thing here. And there are names for it, the GDPR, because uh, it's, well, it's called a data processor. So you may be the data owner, but if you have someone else processing or working with or have a cloud provider that's storing it, they have to be compliant as well. So this can be a bit broader and a little bit more complex and, and tricky to define than, than just understanding things inside your, your brick and mortar. Um, so there are gaps, uh, but how maybe can we take those gaps and use them to our own advantage? And that kind of takes me to the, the next slide where I also have another, some more poll results here. And the poll results here, it was a question, uh, you can see it there, what is your biggest challenge? But the context of this when I was presented is because this was a live poll with a live audience that I was standing in front of. This was in the context of, of uh, GDPR. And you can see here, you know, getting leadership. So that's your C-level executive support to say, yep, this is a strategic initiative. We need to focus on it. Two, budget. Well, Michael hit on that. I did as well. That's uh, obvious. And then, of course, resources. Who's going to do it? Well, these are common challenges, and if this question was about uh, doing, well, quite frankly, just about anything when it comes to information governance, those would probably be the top three challenges. But what's interesting about the GDPR is now you have something that is not just a, just a feel-good exercise, and I say that because there's always, I've worked with people who have tried to uh, initiate initiatives and get budget for, you know, uh, cleaning up content and things like this, and you know, once it floats, bubbles up to to an executive, they, they're asking the question, well, really, what do we get for it? And it's it, it doesn't, there's no measurable reason to do it. Uh, I think a lot of people have been frustrated with that, and I have a lot of customers that are, 
this is something you can point to. It's legislation that's very specific that you can use to your advantage to try to get that executive level support. And uh, the other is you can piggyback on other budgets because even though, and you saw it with Michael's stats, people didn't have a specific GDPR budget, but piggyback on another budget because once there's recognition then say IT, for example, who has budget for other initiatives, maybe not specifically this, but you can then, once you have the awareness, piggyback on that. And if they're doing any sort of modernization, uh, refreshing of systems, uh, 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 you know, storage management, this can become part and parcel of that because they're looking at the data. So an aspect of that could be this. Again, this is just a suggestion. I've seen opportunities where it does work, and of course, other times it may not be appropriate. But as you look internal to your own organization, these are opportunities that, that could work. So the bottom line is when you boil it all down, uh, GDPR, it, there a lot of the core aspects are just about good information governance, and we've all been fighting that for years. And this is an opportunity to really have some momentum around it. So there's opportunity to leverage this um, if it exists. Uh, but let's move on to the next slide because there are certain specific um, groups that have been formed, and there's a trend that's been developing over the industry, and that has to do with. Um, formal IG body, and I'm, this is a reference to uh, the IGI uh, folks who actually did this. This is not my, uh, my poll, but uh, across the industry, uh, and I personally have customers that have formed information governance councils or task force, or they have different names for it, but there are groups internally that have an eye on the proper management and governance of their data and managing their content. So if you have one of these, GDPR is perfect uh, to insert and will help improve the, how should I say, not just awareness, but the horsepower that a uh, formal IG body would have. And if you don't have one and you've wanted to form one, GDPR is the perfect uh, opportunity to wrap uh, that initiative around and say, now we have a chance to form this. There's a reason to do it. So again, if you've been on the cusp or haven't quite been able to do it, GDPR is, is a great opportunity to help with this trend and form uh, an IG body, which again, not just for GDPR, but would be important for you to manage your content ongoing. So I wanna move on to another specific issue. So as we move to the next slide, and, and I know many people on this webinar, I'm certain, have had this problem because it's typical and that is you run into the challenge whenever you're talking about good information governance managing your content whether it's creating data lakes uh, applying uh, you know analytics i mean any of these uh, aspects of trying to properly manage and gain value and mine value out of it it's like wait a minute there's always something that says let's just keep everything and it just begins to pile up and you end up with the massive digital landfill well with GDPR, you better think again, because very, very specifically, it outlines that personal data should only be retained for as long that is necessary. So let's say, for example, you are, I don't, you pull, I'll do something very simple. You poll a group and you want to know the, uh, um, you know, detail about the individuals that you're polling. So you collect all that, you do your poll, you submit, maybe you're writing a white paper, so you do it. Once all that is complete, you now have to purge that data. It has to be eliminated. So you really don't have the option to keep everything any longer when it comes to personal data. So things have changed. The whole notion of let's just keep everything simply doesn't work. And if GDR applies to you, it's against the legislation itself. So this is important. So key challenges, let, let, let me outline a few. So file shares, look, we all know they're pretty loosely managed. That again is one of the main sources where you should go and try to analyze and look for uh, potential threats to GDR appliance. Backup data, this is a big one because that's the, the dark area and organizations have gotten better about keeping only what's appropriate for backup. But again, for your own individual organization and depending on how regulated versus non you are, you may have more backup data than you know. And that's an area that could be very, very risky. Um, so really complying with GDPR is made difficult just through the challenges that we've all as an industry have been facing for years, you know, wacky data storage practices, many silos across the organ, uh, organization. Bringing these things together and having clarity over the content that you have is important to execute on this. So 
GDPR is not a one-time uh, one-time activity. It's ongoing, just like good information governance. So for my portion, I'll conclude with giving you a few ideas. So one, do a content inventory. Understand the islands and the silos of content you have so you get a sense of the landscape. Analyze those backup stores so you know what's there, how old they are. Look for tools you can use, and certainly there are vendors on this panel that can help you with that, of course, but, but look at the tools you may already have to analyze content uh, that includes classification, text indexing, and the ability to move data if it's of a personal nature. So there are ways to do this, and now Mac's going to cover this uh, as he starts with the next slide, but you know, you could even leverage some of your current e-discovery practices, and I'm not saying that e-discovery is remotely it's not the same as a request for, and I'll let Matt go into that, but those tools and those processes could be leveraged to at least analyze what you have. So bottom line, uh, GDR compliance is a long term. Uh, you got to be in it for, for the long run because it's not just today. You don't do one cleanup and and uh, once and done. It's an ongoing process you have to be prepared for. So with that, let me hand it uh, to Mac. Thank you, Reid. So I'm going to go through uh, what is a subject access request and talk about the um, <clears throat> the mechanics of this. And GDPR clarifies the reason for allowing individuals to access their data. And it's really just to make sure that you are, as a business, using their data correctly. So um, as Reid pointed out, if you're keeping data too long, you're, in, you, you're, uh, you're doing the wrong thing. So, or if you're using it inappropriately, um, <clears throat> you're using it to discriminate against somebody, or the information itself is incorrect. Um, one of the things that's happening though here is that uh, of the GDPR legislation, you are going to have less time to actually comply with these uh, requests. So you'll have to um, send back a, an answer within a month of the receipt of the request. And um, although that sounds like a long time, as I'll show you in a little while here, um, those requests could back up pretty quickly. So how many SARS can you expect? Um, so at one point in the UK, there was, and there still is actually, a £10 charge to request a subject access request. Um, and during the uh, crisis with uh, certain insurance payments that were illegal, people were quite willing to get that, pay that £10. In fact, people paid it for them and they would come in they get a payoff from the insurance companies and banks, which um, which covered that ten pounds. Now, from as soon as GDPR comes into effect, there is no barrier to entry. Normal charges need to be dropped. The only time that a company can charge money doing a, a subject access request is if it's um, an extreme request and it, it looks like it's going to cost an awful lot of money to to deliver the information back. So, how many can we expect? Well, the math actually is quite simple. Um, so take a medium-sized insurance company with, with a million lives insured and then say, on average, a person requests a SAR every 20 years, which I'll get back to that in a second. It's actually quite conservative. So 5% of a million, so 50,000 a year, 1,000 a week, 200 a day, standard working day, eight hours. I know we all work more than that, but these are bankers. So eight hours, that's 25 SARs an hour. Now think about how many people that will take to actually go through those 25 SARS. Um, I was talking to a large bank just recently and they have um, 16 people working on this and they do less than eight SARS a day, less than eight a day. Um, so there's obviously a need for, a, for some kind of solution here, else this is just going to overwhelm um, the companies involved. And if you think that 5% sounds like a high number, there was a recent poll done in the UK and Ireland where between 35 and 40% of the people said they would be asking one of the people who deliver goods and services to them for a SAR that year. So 40% could be asking for those SARs. Present landscape is the reason why it's so difficult, there's lots of data, it's all over the place. Um, as 
Michael and Reid were saying, you know, if you do the right thing and you implement information governance, then you're probably going to be in a better place. But most companies do not have good information governance in place. They have data in places they don't even know about. Um, there's lots of different tools. So, you know, people have bought point solutions over the years and gone out and used those to maybe index the content, maybe index the, the metadata. It's, it's just a mishmash of things. And you don't even get to be able to use the same search terms in all those different tools because after all, they're different tools. Some of them are metadata tools, useful, but won't get you down to what's needed for a SAR. Uh, a few full text indexing tools are used, again, not used extensively enough. You don't have a complete index of what's in your unstructured data, your ungoverned data. And there's no common criteria. So what we mean by that is um, I generate a, um, a search request, a search criteria on one tool, it doesn't work on another tool. So what happens is this is this is tedious and painstaking task. And uh, from the people who are doing this, I know that they are literally pulling their hair out trying to um, produce consistent results. So as people say, and I, I just heard Reed say, ah, oh, it's like e-discovery. Well, yes, to a certain extent. So e-discovery tools work well to gather lots of data about a particular matter. So you know, you have a somebody sues you, you go figure, figure out who the custodians are, you go and find all the information from those custodians and you put it into a, a um, an archive or a box of some sort and say, okay, I've, I've found all the information I need. That works for e-discovery. Problem with, the, with that analogy is that you very rarely see more than double figures, even for large companies. Um, 50 or 60 cases a year would, would be, you know, quite a lot for, for, for even a large company. Whereas, um, as we just pointed out, the number of subject access requests you're going to see is a much, much higher number. The other thing that SARS demand is lots of different data, sorry, lots of data about lots of different matters. So what you'll end up with is instead of, oh, I've got a very targeted uh, e-discovery type search. No, I've got a very broad search that says, go and find me all of Richard McDonald's information in the whole of your system okay and that's a much much different search to you know find me the information about richard mcdonald to do with this particular uh, legal case this particular project the other thing is many companies that don't have a lot of litigation going on don't do their own internal e-discovery they rely on outside attorneys to do it and that's way too expensive for SARS. you're not going to hire an outside attorney to do your subject access requests. So a perfect solution would be one index to search, one repository to secure, one interface to use, and the ability to use common criteria because you, you're doing only the ones. That, from our perspective, sounds like unified archive. But we understand that a lot of people will have a long journey to get to unified archive. So what does an interim solution look like? Well, let's index the ungoverned data, so file shares, SharePoint, et cetera. Rank the risk of the data objects by PII contained. So one of the in interesting items that's come out is that you have a situation where somebody says, okay, give me all my information, and say we have a list that is called delinquent customers, and their, their name happens to be on that list. Well, the last thing you want to do is allow that list out of the building because then you've actually created your own data breach. So you need to be able to, to, to automatically figure out which objects have a very high risk of data leakage, of actually exposing other people's PII or sensitive information. Um, and you can do that through using a combination of regular expressions, uh, keyword um, searches, and getting a risk weighting automatically to these objects. So if an object Object has a high risk rate, risk weighting, you don't let it out of the door. Audit trails the search. You've got to be able to show that what, what you've done is correct. You've got to be able to show that when somebody asks for you to delete something, you've actually deleted it. You have to show that when it's been corrected, you've done the proper correction. So that's that's all the audit trails will do for you there. Um, multiple interfaces, but redu reduce as much as possible. So let's let's figure out how we can get rid of some of those different tools reduce it down to 
maybe one or two tools rather than 15 or 16. So this is what we would say sounds like file analysis and management. So the fan, our fan product, plus maybe some other solutions for different areas of, of the, um, the business. Um, first question, are commercial businesses considered an EU resident? In other words, does GDPR apply to a business? Ah, it's an interesting question, actually, because um, GDPR talks pretty extensively about natural persons. And, and this is really to do with individuals' rights as opposed to uh, an EU business. But if you take that one step further, who are you dealing with when you deal with a business? I mean, businesses aren't, um, or not yet anyway, you know, consisting of computers and, and, and artificial intelligence. So you're dealing with people, you're collecting possibly people's information as well. So although I don't think the, the answer is yes, definitely, I think there's a, a nuance to that that says yes, quite probably you would you would be covered by it. Um, I've seen some interesting discussions about you know B2B transactions, whether they rise to the level of um, GDPR. Um, the other piece that we see is um, employees in those businesses definitely are covered by GDPR. So if you're doing business in Europe, you're selling products to another business, then there is a pretty good chance that you're going to be covered by GDPR. But Michael, Reed, do you want to um, step in on this? Yeah, I would just add to that. I, and a, that was a great, a great answer because there's a lot of soft edges to a lot of these questions because, you know, it's not May 2018 yet, but once it does, and we'll see this in practice, well, there will certainly well, there will be a lot of lessons learned and uh, how it's enforced, what's enforced, and how strictly it's enforced. I, I would just say that, you know, there's a lot of other um, situations where uh, there have been arguments where is a company – a, a does it have its own identity and i would say at this point the intent and i'll so i'll answer a little bit differently because uh from an intent standpoint this is about individuals e, you know citizens personal yeah. information so as opposed to a company you know please purge that you ever heard of uh, procter and gamble you know so it's uh but to his point, the people involved with the organization, of course, that, that they would be covered. So I hope that, uh, again, just a couple of different lenses. And then in practice, I guess, uh, Mac, we'll, we'll see how it rolls. Yeah, and, yeah. and one other point along with that, um, you know, not uh, that's probably going to, you know, fuzz the soft edges up even a little bit more. Uh, there was the Citizens United case in the United States uh, determined and the, the U.S. Supreme Court determined that for the purposes of constitutional rights, corporations are citizens. So I don't know what impact that would have on GDPR, but essentially a, a company in the United States has a constitutional right to free speech and so forth. So, you know, it, it may at least, you know, on this side of the Atlantic, uh, be ruled that the corporations are people. Uh, yeah, I did actually think about that, but um, I was, I'm, I'm at a GDPR conference at the moment, and I was corrected by a Belgian person who told me that they're Law works on the Napoleonic principle of the law rather than case law. So uh, um, I, I, I'm not sure that um, the U.S. case law would affect um, European rights. Hmm. Anyway, um, Beverly, do we have anything else from? Um, I think that actually wraps it up, and I think we do um, are able to stop on time. So thank you for um, coming to our webinar today, and thank you to the panelists. Hmm.